Africa Prime, brought to you by Jamison Select Reserve. Welcome back to Africa Prime. Dr. Um Obama is still with us. And we, before we went to the break, we were just talking about the, getting the first letter from Barack Obama Jr. You actually went to Chicago to meet him. What was the first meeting like? Uh, the first meeting was amazing because um, when I initially planned to go, I had taken time out for a month to be in America. And the reason I did that was because I wasn't sure that I was going to like my brother, that he was going to like me. And I thought, well, it's going to be really awkward if I'm in America and I'm just visiting him and we don't like each what other. What if he's a loser? Yeah, what if he's a loser, basically, yes. yes. So what I did was I, I have a very good friend who was living in Illinois, thank God, at the time, in Carbondale. So I planned to go for a month and I spent like uh, two weeks or almost two weeks with her. And then in between, I had 10 days to go and visit Barak. And then at the end, I had some time to go back and spend with her just in case I didn't like him so I could go and lick my wounds and, you know, feel and sorry recover. for myself yes. and recover before I go back to Germany. But uh, it really, from the moment he called my name, and I realized it was him and we started talking. We really hit it off and I can't explain why. All I can say is that I'm blessed that that was possible because it could have been gone the other way. But the minute I met him, it was like I'd always known him all my life. And um, yeah, that was it. And the, the 10 days we just kind of talked nonstop, exchanged information and just got to know each other to the point that by the time I was leaving, it was like I'd known him all my life, not just from knowing him through my dad, but also right. that he had been in my life you know, all that time. And you took him back, you had him come back to Allegro and meet your grandmother and the rest of the extended family. I'm sure that must have been magical. That was as well, because um, he came, he gave me more time than I gave him. He came for a month. Right. And, uh, you know, we went and visited all the relatives. We were up country in Allegro with my grandmother. We went to see my family, my mother's side of the family on the other side of the lake in Kindu Bay. Right. Um, you know, we, we, we traveled everywhere. And Everybody was curious about him because everybody knew about him. My dad had always talked about him. So everybody wanted to see him and, and, and talk to him and, 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 you know, welcome him into their homes. And in a way, it was very funny because he was very eager and he's also very low maintenance. So it was yes. very easy. He lived with me in my little apartment. You know, we put up a camp bed for him and he was fine with that. I'm not yes. much of a cook, but he was happy to eat his peanut butter yeah, you don't and, make and salads. And, you know, exactly. I'm not that <laughs> African woman, you know. Yes. So, you know, he would have a warm meal in the, week, in the week and we'd, you know, we'd, improvised but he was very easy in that way and we saw a lot of relatives and the interesting thing was for me the, the great thing about it was also that there were many relatives that I hadn't really bothered with that much or we didn't really get along that well but because they were significant right. in terms of being members of our family he would insist you know we're going to see these people and you, you I want to get to know them and he really didn't discriminate across the board he really tried to get to know his family and it was really great for me to be the one to be you know able to show him his family in the meantime you moved from Germany after 16 years to England for yes, love yes I dare say what yeah. happened what a question <laughs> no I, I'm interested I'd like to know how, how well, that you happened know, you fall in love you yes. kind of figure out where you're gonna be and if your love is in a particular place you go and stay there yes. let me put you through the steps one two three <laughs> and then you know yes. I, I got married there lived there unfortunately it, it didn't last I had my daughter there so right. I'm blessed with a little girl and yeah, so I ended up living in England for 11 years, which was quite an experience actually, because having come from Kenya, former colony of the United Kingdom, yes. I assumed it was going to be really easy, and you know, I'm going to recognize everything, and it's going to be culturally not difficult. But strangely enough, I'd already been, by then been in Germany for 16 years. Yeah. So moving to England was, for me, a real culture so shock in certain ways. I mean, I always like to joke that the, the thing that was most familiar were the red telephone boxes. Because we have because, those you know, in we, Kenya. We have those in Kenya as yes. well, or we had them. I think we have fewer now. Anymore, yes. Yeah, but we had those but really culturally it was a very different space and again based on the fact that in Germany I was able to really come of age as, 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 a, an, as a, a, a woman with her own identity and in England it was very much very traditional because I was in the suburbs so it was still very conservative you know women in the kitchen the men in the parlor right. talking politics and football and it was a really difficult environment for me to be in so that was quite a, a strange experience for me being in England. I got used to it after a while, yes. but I, I can't say that I, I adapted to the English way of, of living very quickly and very easily. Somewhere along the line, you took up humanitarian work and you're still going ahead with that. Tell us about your work. Yeah. Well, my work is really, for me, in a way, more than just my work, because in the course of the, the different things I did in England, I, I realized that all of what I've been doing since I started studying, or since I've been me in a conscious way, was all around communication. How do you communicate with people? How do you deal with being involved with different cultures? How do you move agendas forward to make a difference in the world? 
and in, in trying to find a place to do that, I went through using the literature, yes. I went through work doing film in the film school, and went to work in marketing as well, you know, trying to work with people and see how to influence people. Yes. And then I realized that actually the place I really want to work is with young people, because they don't have an agenda, you know, they, they, they are like a tabula rasa, they don't have baggage like adults do, yes. and, and they really are more willing to take risks and learn and try and try different things, and they need things to hold on to, to get to, to be able to create a feature for themselves. So I started working with youth in England initially. And while working in England, I realized that the culture is so different. The youth and the adult culture, there's such a big gulf between the two of them that in order to be able to make a difference in that community, I would have to try and change the culture, which as an individual person coming from a different culture would be next to impossible. You know, you could help a few young people, but the trend towards how young people were being seen was very difficult to change. So I thought to myself, I really need to give back to my community. And that's when I started having, you know, feeling the need to go back to Kenya and give back. Yes. And that's when I've found work with Care International, work with them for five years, working with young people, using sports for social change. And then now, since uh, about a, two months, I've moved to work within my foundation full time because we're not just using sports to try and help young people to change their lives. We're also talking about what happens at the end of all the time you work with them in the program. What's the exit strategy? We're trying to look for ways to make young people mentally be in a place where they can actually take control of their lives and have the strength and the courage and the ability to say no to you know ways of doing things that will not help them and make them find a way to, to, to their own destiny. What did they feed you in the Obama childhood family when you were young? Because uh, Barack was also a community organizer back in the days, and of course, he's who we know him today as. What is it that breathes leadership in that family? Well, I'm not aiming to be a president, so. <laughs> you never know. I don't think we, we really ate from the same plate in that sense. Um, I don't know. When people ask me that question, I think what I say is maybe what we have in common is that we're, 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 bo we're both driven in terms of what we believe in. We all want to make a difference. Uh, so we have a social conscience yes. that drives us towards wanting to make a difference. And I think that's something that maybe we have from our father because he had that same social conscience. He unfortunately was living in a time where I feel he was be before his time and didn't have the infrastructure to support and, and so assist him in doing that. And he himself personally probably didn't know how to do it that well. But my brother obviously has done it to a level that you know, very few are able to achieve. And I do it in my little way just because I'm driven by the fact that I know that I can contribute. Yes. For me, doors are open, but I also can open doors for others. But in opening doors for others, especially with young people, we have to work in such a way that we enable them to be able to go through those doors. And you that's what we do. You worked on President Obama's campaign for a stretch. Mm -hmm. well, what exactly did you do and how did that inform, or did you even see him becoming president at that point? Well, of course, we had to believe that he was going to become president. Otherwise, you couldn't you work on, on the campaign. campaign. Sure, so yes. that, was the, that was really the, the driving force in the campaign, that we really believed that he could do this. And, and what our role, my role was, because I worked as a family member, so a good part of my role was also working with those who were in the campaign, working for him, just letting them know who he is so they have a better story and a, and a, and a stronger story to tell about who he is. And the experience for me was amazing because it was very humbling because we had people coming from South Africa, we had people coming from Germany, young people who had taken time out from university and from school a whole year to work on the campaign, and they couldn't even vote. Right. But because they said it was so important for the world that he become president, that they w were willing to sacrifice that time even though they couldn't vote. So when he became president, what do you tell him? Do you call him up and what do you say? Congratulations. Really proud of you. That really? was... Yeah, yeah. Your brother yeah. just became president of the United States, and all you say is congratulations. <laughs> Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? Well, I guess that's you know, what, what, more, what more can you say? Because you know, you're very proud, and also because he had worked so hard, you know, it was just like, yes, this is this is he really deserves this, and um, and you, do, you you don't doubt it because yes. you believe in the person. So it was just a moment of being able to exhale and say wonderful you know it really has happened and it was historical as well I mean yes. I, I don't put I don't make it less than what it was it was a historical moment and I was just proud to be uh, you know it would, to be there to to see somebody who is a member of my family make this historical moment a reality so does having the sign name Obama mean you, you've become like a huge celebrity internationally people are looking for interviews I'm honored oh, to be sitting here with you now don't say that you know <laughs> for me it's always a shock every time yes. and I say what it's done to my life is that I do get these interviews I've, up to now I've only seen you on TV so I'm like oh Larry McDowell I'm get going to have an interview here, with him no. so it's it, it works both ways right and for me I always have to you know 
it, it comes as a surprise every now and then. And I, every time, actually, and I have to always remind people about that, that really if people invite me and want to see me because I'm Obama's sister, yes. they really have to also try and find out more about me. Otherwise, they've, they've been cheated out of a lot more. And I hope that people are also interested in knowing about my work and who I am so that I can have, do credit to my brother because just riding on his name is not in my interest yes. and it doesn't go very far. So, you know, the celebrity status is, is something that it, at the can be very superficial if I don't make the best of it. And I'm very aware of the responsibility I have as his sister to yes. make a difference. So I hope that I, you know, I'll do him justice in that sense and, and also the young people that I work with. So do you talk and do, does everybody ask you to have a meeting with the president and people are looking for favors because you're called Obama? Um, that happens too, yes. People will, you know, have interact with me uh, sometimes on the assumption that they're going to have breakfast with him or right. you know, be able to... So I'm not going to have breakfast with no, him? No, I don't. Unfortunately, Sadly no, Larry, you're not going to have <laughs> breakfast with him. No. I try. I hardly get to have breakfast with him, you know, when he's so busy. So, you know, yes. it's not that easy to have breakfast with him. But um, no, no, people do. People do hope for that. Yes. And some people have asked me blatantly, have said, you know, that's the reason why I want to, to, you know, to interact with you. And I always draw the line because I say, for me, my brother is my brother, first and foremost. Yes. As boring as it may seem, as unexciting and, and, and you know because most people are excited about him as a president yes. I'm excited about him as my brother and my little brother at that so it's I, I have a completely different position and I don't and I don't get flustered about him being president because that is not a priority in our relationship. But it it's has important. Up, as you said, it has opened doors for you yes, to be able to and put I appreciate your work out that. there. Yes. And I don't put it down and I don't belittle it. But if I was to think that way, first of all, it would blow my own mind because yes. I wouldn't be able to cope with it. And also because I work with young people, I want to be a role model for them as who I am. And if I am going to flaunt that I'm the, daughter, the sister of the president of the United States of America, no young people can see me as a role model because they're not going to have a brother or sister who's going to be president of the United States of America. Right. Very unlikely. So then I cut off that ability to be able to uh, impact them. So I'm aware of that as well. You know, a lot of Kenyans do not like that. He's not been to Kenya. I'm sure you saw this coming, but he's been to Ghana and Egypt. So you can put in a word for us? I'll do my best. Excellent. That, that is a good enough try. But tell me, he's under a lot of criticism in the U.S. because of the nature of how that political process works. But do you feel he's been unfairly judged? I think, you know what, what I feel that people need to do is look a lot more at what he's achieved and really seriously look at what he's achieved against the odds. And I actually have, because the campaign has obviously started, yes. that the campaign has put together a list of what Barack Obama has achieved. And I tell you, that list is long. And people need to realize, against all of the odds that he's had to deal with, he has achieved so much. So in my opinion, my brother has given 100% of himself. And more than 100% of yourself, you cannot give. And if that's not good enough, then so be it. I mean, people get the leaders that they deserve. So I hope America you know, is going to be wise around that and realize you know, what they have in my brother and not cut off their noses to spite their faces. Right. And finally, finish off, finish off with us with the future. What is your vision? What are you left to do? Well, I'd love to continue with the work with the foundation because the model that I'm trying to use is around changing the mindset of being a victim and also being in a position where you're constantly begging, literally, through what has happened with development aid. I would like young people to be able to be confident enough to take their own lives into their own hands and take responsibility, even in poverty, of what they become and what they do with their lives. All right, Dr. Omar Obama, it's been most fascinating. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you for having me here. All right, and that's how we leave it for Africa Prime. Thank you for watching.